Well, I think you would agree that the Word of God is sufficient and it is filled with illustrations that help us to understand many of the Bible's truths. And so I want to do that by way of introduction, to introduce you to the truths that we'll be learning in Proverbs chapter 21. I want us to turn to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 7. In Joshua chapter 7, we read about Israel being defeated when they first tried to seize Ai. Now, the letters are A-I. The name of the place is I. Okay? So in Joshua chapter 7, we read this in verses 4 and 5. So about 3,000 men went up from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Other translations render verse 4 as, And they were defeated. And it is true. The men fled before the men of Ai. Many of them were struck down. Israel was defeated. This is, it seems to be, the only major defeat of Israel, Israel being defeated, in the entire record of the conquest of Joshua and the Israelites in the book of Joshua. Why was Israel defeated in this instance? Well, we know that God promised to deliver Israel's enemies into her hand. So why did this happen? Well, we know that God also gave them very specific instructions about how to do the conquest that they needed to obey. And the problem here in chapter 7 of Joshua was that Israel was compromised. Look at verse 1 of Joshua 7. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things for Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Joshua had clearly ordered the Israelites, we will devote everything to destruction. You're not supposed to take any, pillage the towns and take stuff for yourself, but Achan did. We read in verse 10 and 11 and 12, that the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. You see the reversal? They were supposed to devote the entire city to destruction previously, but they didn't, so now God will devote them to destruction I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. And so Joshua did. Achan was executed. And then Joshua organized a second attack. We already know that the soldiers under the power of the king of Ai, those soldiers had the power to strike down Israelites. They already showed that they were strong. But now, in obedience to God, Joshua organized a second attack. And what he does here would be um, known by the world and is recognized until this day as military genius. Joshua took some of his army and had them attack from the north of Ai. Only part of the army, though. Looking impressive, looking strong, but only part of the army. This was actually a diversion there were another 5,000 Israelite men hiding in the west of Ai. And so, as the attackers came from the north, the king of Ai saw this, and he sent all of his men to charge forth. He was thinking, we've got enough people, we will destroy them. And they went north against the Israelites. And he pretty much sent everyone And as they went north, suddenly out come 5,000 Israelite soldiers, Israelite men from the west. They 
were left vulnerable, the city was. And the city was absolutely obliterated. They set it on fire. And so as they set it on fire, the soldiers of Ai that have gone west to go against the, the northern attackers, the Israelites, saw the smoke in the city and said, what's going on? We need to defend our city. And they went back, but it was too late. They were done for. Now they were sandwiched between a wall of Israelites from the north and coming from the city. And they tried to do what they could, but they were slaughtered. I was conquered by the hand of God because God gave Joshua wisdom. And wisdom, as you would have heard read from Ecclesiastes, often just looks like a weak, poor little man with not much going on. But he has the ability to deliver a city. Wisdom has the ability to win battles. And this in the book of Joshua is a historical, real-life illustration of what we're about to see in Proverbs chapter 21, verses 21 to 31. The message I bring before you is this, and you'll see it in your liturgy. Worldly philosophies, earthly chariots, human rulers, Satan, and our own sin do not stand a chance against the infinite wisdom of our God. Like we said, Joshua's military strategy here continues to be applauded <clears throat> and even applied by military leaders today. You'll see movies about it. It's a clear example of how wise warfare will often lead to victory even against powerful enemies. So if you come to Proverbs 21, in the last verse, in verse 31, that's what it tells us. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. And we know that Joshua was a type and shadow of the true commander of the Lord's army, the great warrior, Jesus Christ. I want you to notice, especially for those who are with us this whole Lord's Day and heard the preaching this morning, what almost seems like a contrast. The Jesus of John 18, betrayed, arrested, walking right into the hands of his would-be captors, unjustly tried, sentenced to death, hung on a Roman cross. And we talked about that and how Jesus humbly went to his death. And then now we're about to talk about Jesus as a great warrior. Is there a contradiction here? Well, I will argue that the answer is no, there is no contradiction here. Because just as Jesus will tell Pontius Pilate in the Gospel of John, my kingdom is not of this world. The way that he wages war right now in the unseen realm that is happening at this very moment is also not of this world. It is a spiritual war that he wages at the moment. He wages war against Satan, sin, and death. Yes, one day he will be that rider on a white horse who comes with a sword coming out of his mouth, eyes looking like flames to judge the living and the dead. But right now he is at war. By his spirit, he wages war against our flesh. In fact, we have been conquered. We have been conquered by the Lord Jesus. And after he conquers us, he now makes us his soldiers. And as his soldiers, he teaches us to wage war using his wisdom. By his wisdom, we wage war against evil and unbiblical philosophies and the wicked practices of the heathen and especially our own remaining sin. Only wisdom can win this war. Wisdom wins the war. Unlike Achan who compromised Israel with his sin, wisdom wants to protect us. Wisdom says in verse 21 of Proverbs 21, whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. Now, just remember that we're told in Galatians 2.16 that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So it's Christ's righteousness. It is through Christ's righteousness and kindness that we will find life, 
righteousness and honor. The righteousness that the wise soldier must pursue first and foremost so that he might have life is the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness that you need to have eternal life, to live, is found in a man who is a mighty warrior yet made himself low and poor. I bring your attention to our first point. A poor man delivers a city. We read in verse 22, a wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the stronghold in which they trust. We've got a heavenly warrior who knows how to crush strongholds, but his strength is often hidden from us. Much like the hidden 5,000 Israelite men that Joshua put in the west of Ai, Come with me to the book of Ecclesiastes, which we read from earlier, and turn to the ninth chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. The wrong way. I've gone the wrong way. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And we read this in verse 13. I have also seen this example of wisdom under the sun, and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it. Here's what the king did. Building great siege works against it. But there was found in it a poor, wise man. And he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that poor man. But I say that wisdom is better than might, though the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. Hear it again. I say wisdom is greater than might. Somehow, there was this wise poor man who found a way, because of his wisdom, to deliver the city from the big, strong king, showing that wisdom is greater than might. Well, I want to tell you that this poor wise man is none other than our Lord Jesus. He is the wise man who seems lowly and poor. Indeed, he was rich, but for our sakes, he made himself poor. And his wisdom is greater than the might of any earthly king. Turn with me now to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Luke, the 11th chapter. Luke, chapter 11, verse 21. Jesus, who was casting out a demon in verse 14, was accused by some people saying, He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And this is what Jesus says in verse 21. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. You see the wisdom in the way that this man wages war? He he finds a way to take away his armor in which he once trusted, and then he divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. The strong man here that's being spoken of is Satan. And he is strong. He's got his plunder. He's got his possessions. He's got people. He's got souls under his wing, under his darkness, deceived. But Jesus somehow defeats this strong man, Satan. How does Jesus defeat the strong man, Satan? Well, we know that in Jesus' poverty, in making himself low and even laying down his life, he defeats the strong man. People would think 
that to defeat this strong man, you need bigger armor and bigger swords and bigger artillery so that you can fight this strong man with the same kind of physical might, yet Jesus defeats Satan by the wisdom of the cross, which is foolishness to those who are perishing. This is how our Lord fights. Let me ask you, when is a ruler who is going against an enemy most proud? I am sure that person is most proud when he sees the lifeless body of his enemy. We win. We've destroyed the enemy. Look at him. Bloody. Dead. As Jesus hung dead on that tree, Satan must have felt like a winner. But after Jesus was laid in a tomb, Satan's armor was taken away. And before he knew it, his spoil was divided as Jesus descended to Hades and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison. As we see in 1 Peter 3.19, a proclamation of victory. It looked like Jesus lost, but because of his wisdom, he actually won. Through the cross, his burial, his resurrection. It is as that old book by John Owen puts it. It was the death of death in the death of Christ. And so Jesus, in this way, by actually dying, laying down his life, won the battle. He won the war. He continues to conquer today, one soul at a time. He is plundering the kingdom of darkness. He is the one who scales the city of death and brings down the strongholds which ensnare us. Idols defeated, love for the world vanquished, repentance and faith gifted and granted. And now we who have been conquered join the Lord's army. That brings us secondly to the fact that we are vanquished by wisdom. Resistance is futile. Turn with me to Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Two Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse three. This is speaking of us Christians now. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Jesus, wisdom manifests, he can destroy strongholds. And now he's given you the weapons yourself to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. So the wisdom of the Word of God looks poor to the world. It's not flashy, but it is rich, and it has the power to destroy the world's lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God. Cultural opinion, political opinion, Whatever opinion raises itself up against the knowledge of God, we have the weapons now to destroy these things. And so the war now begins. But I want you to know that the war begins with us. There is still a war waging within us. We know how to spot these arguments and lofty opinions raised against God because we've held them. We've believed these things. We've been held captive by the deceit of Satan, but now we've been vanquished by wisdom, and now we've got the weapons to fight them. Go back to Proverbs chapter 21, now in verse 23. I'll give you some examples of how wisdom now teaches us to fight this war and to wage this battle. Whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Wisdom knows that a lot of our problems in life come from our mouth. It's because of the stuff that we say. We get ourselves into trouble. We speak unwisely. We get into trouble. But wisdom says, guard your mouth and guard your life. 
You see, when we talk about wisdom giving us the weapons we need to wage this warfare, don't forget that it begins with you. There's still indwelling sin. There's still remnants of foolishness that remains in you, and you need to continue being vanquished by wisdom. Guard your mouth and guard your life. You see, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Proverbs 14 verse 1. And this is a common theme in Proverbs. Tame the tongue. Watch your mouth. Psalm 141 verse 3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. Verse 24. Scoffer is the name of the arrogant, haughty man who acts with arrogant pride. Reminds us of what we studied previously in verse 11. When a scoffer is punished, the simple becomes wise. It's interesting how the historical people, the Moabites, actually fit this description really well. We read, and you don't need to turn there, in Isaiah 16 verse 6, we have heard of the pride of Moab, how proud he is of his arrogance, his pride, and his insolence. In his idol, idol boasting, he is not right. Contrast being made between the people of God who are to be lowly and humble in subjection to the wisdom of God and those in the world who are wise in their own eyes who trust in their own selves, who trust in chariots and horses, while the people of God trust not in their own wisdom, but the wisdom of the Lord. Let's say and remind ourselves again of that slogan of Wisdom University, that slogan written on the wall of Wisdom Uni, where Solomon is principal. You haven't forgotten that you're in Wisdom Uni, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fools despise wisdom. Fools despise knowledge. Verse 25, the desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. All day long he craves and craves but the righteous gives and does not hold back. Let's get more practical in our daily warfare. Much of our remaining foolishness needs to be vanquished still. We need to fight against that, that, that indwelling sin in us. It's a bit redundant. The sin that remains in us, which still pulls us towards sluggishness and slothfulness instead of fruitfulness for the glory of God. And I am speaking both physical and spiritual. The sluggard is the one who desires, he wants, he craves, but he doesn't do. Therefore, your desire ends up killing you. It ends up killing you either because your slothfulness and sluggishness means that you do not work and you starve to death, or it ends up killing you because we know how deadly it is to desire and to desire and to never get. Let me, let me give you both a natural principle here, drawn from this, as well as a spiritual principle. Let's go again to the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Two Thessalonians chapter 3. Down in verse 10. This is a natural principle, everyone. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Let him not eat. The, the one who desires to eat needs to work. If you want money, you need to do something. If you want resources, you need to cultivate. You need to work. You need to be fruitful. Now let's turn to a spiritual principle. Go to the, the book of James, the letter of James, chapter 4. 
James chapter 4, verse 2. You do not desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. It ought to be true in the world for all people naturally that he who is unwilling to work shall not eat. But for us Christians who understand that the battle against spirit and flesh and what is going on in the world, first and foremost, we need to check our very cravings, our very desires. What is it that we want? For some want the exact same thing. They also want money. We should all want some money because we can use it for the benefit of ourselves, of our families, of everyone. So everybody needs some kind of money. If it's not money, then maybe it's gold. If you're super old school, just go back to gold. Right? You don't like cash? That's fine. Whatever. The point is you need to work, you need to cultivate, you need to sell, or you need to buy, you need to do all of these things to function as a human being. And if you don't work, you don't get to eat. But at the same time, there's still a distinction between those who desire those very things for vainglory. Those who desire those things because they believe that to get a lot of it will satisfy them. They build their lives upon riches. They build their lives upon money. Now, on the other hand, the godly person, they also desire to have some wealth, to have some resources, to have some money. But for what reason? For the glory of God. And how do they glorify God? By being good stewards of the resources that God has entrusted to them. You know, this is very relevant, I'm sure, especially for our church members in light of recent discussions uh, about finances and whatnot. But if it is a true natural principle that those who desire to eat need to work, how much truer should it be for us as a church that those who desire the faithful ministry of the Word of God ought to work hard in order to support it, to support it financially? To, to support it through your resources, to share with one another, and share even with your ministers all good things, just as you have been taught. But no, the sluggard, the, the sluggard that sometimes still remains in us, desires these things. Oh, it sounds great. Oh, it sounds great to be in a good church. Oh, I'm so glad I'm not in a prosperity gospel church. I'm so glad I'm not in this kind of congregation. Oh, we've got pretty good doctrine. You desire, you desire. But don't be like the sluggard who desires but does not do, for this shall kill you. As opposed to the sluggard, Proverbs tells us about the righteous. What is it about the righteous? Well, the righteous gives and does not hold back. You have much. The Lord has blessed you with much. But unlike those in the world, you don't close your fists too tightly. You see, the difference between that of the fool in the world who maybe gains a lot of riches and the godly person in the church who gains a lot of riches is oftentimes the fool just wants to store up barn houses. He just wants to store up wealth. But the godly person wants some wealth because he wants to let go of it. Not to waste it, but to be charitable and to be generous and to bless his brothers and sisters, and to bring glory to his God by showcasing his generosity as a reflection of the generosity of our good God because all good things come from him. All of it comes from him. It belongs to him. And so we use it as he sees fit. He doesn't hold back on generosity, the righteous one, when he has the ability. Let, let's do another natural principle then spiritual principle kind of thing. Natural principles. Go to 1 Timothy 5 8. One Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. 
I call it a natural principle because look at the argument that he makes. Even unbelievers should get this. And you're acting worse than an unbeliever. If you are not laboring, especially if you are a man, to provide for your household. Now, let's see how that translates into a spiritual principle in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In 2 Corinthians 9, the context is Paul exhorting the Corinthians to increase in the grace of giving, to grow in generosity. And we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now just hold on right there. Let's not allow our reaction against the horrors of the prosperity gospel to forget that this remains a biblical principle. You reap what you sow. I mean, I'm just reading from the Word of God. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And what is the context? Giving. The context is giving. The context is helping the needy church and for them to give. It continues in verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. So get that part. You should not be forced to do this because God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And Paul roots all of this, if you didn't know, in the previous chapter, chapter 8, he roots all of this in the generosity of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, in verse 9, For you know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that you by His poverty might become rich. This is the heart of the Christian virtue of generosity. When we are generous, someone gains, and technically we lose. Correct? When you are generous to your brethren, to the church, to someone in need, Okay, money is not magical. You are not going to give them, and it's still in your account. No, it's left your account now. You have lost it, and they have gained it. And that's the reality. And Paul roots the Christian virtue of generosity in the fact that Jesus is the richest of the rich. He is God in the flesh. He is rich, yet for your sake, he became poor. For your sake he became poor, so that, here's the thing, you, through his poverty, might now become rich. And brethren, this is what we should be thinking when we are seeking to grow in generosity. Paul is exhorting the Corinthians in chapter 8 to learn to give generously. And what we should be thinking is, just as Jesus was willing to become poor that I might become rich, I am willing to lose what seems to be mine, so that others might gain. So that others might be rich through my loss. That is the motive behind it. That is the exhortation for Christian generosity. And that's what makes our gaining of wealth and resources so different from the foolishness of this world. Because the strange thing about it, laboring, working hard, even the natural principle of providing for your household is this. The world says, gain, 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 so you always can benefit, benefit, benefit. But the Christian push is always gain, 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 so that you may give, give, give. Gain, 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 so that you can bless, bless, bless. Gain, 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 so that you could provide for the household and the household of God. Hear what the psalmist says in Psalm 
chapter 112 in verse 5. It is well with a man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. Brethren, wisdom is telling you today that if you increase in this Christian generosity, it will go well for you. And often, the principle of reaping what you sow is indeed not like what some of these heretics teach, that by giving a certain percentage, you will immediately receive back ten times that percentage. No, but you will gain greatly. What are we talking about? There will be great gain in that through your generosity, you will look around you and you will see the needy, the brethren, the church, the body of Christ increase. That is your gain. Your gain is the gain of others. Back to Proverbs 21, now in verse 27. In doing this, okay, in doing this, don't forget, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he brings it with evil intent? It's in, in the several years of the life of this church, plant, hardly have I ever talked about something like that, that direct, about giving in the church, about offerings. And so it is appropriate that I also give you the reminder that Proverbs gives you that as you are exhorted and pushed to increase in the grace of giving, to be generous, just know that the heart does matter. Each one should give as he has decided in his heart, not someone else's heart, but your heart. Not because he said so, but because you want to. Because God loves a cheerful giver. On the other hand, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. If I could transpose that, the offering of the wicked is an abomination to God. doesn't matter how much money that is, how much resources that is. If you bring it with evil intent, the Lord is not pleased. Proverbs, once again, brings us back to the heart. Mercy is better than sacrifice. External religiosity, big offerings without love is worthless. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. So speaking once again of giving, this really hits at the heart of why the word of faith, prosperity, gospel teaching really is poison. I don't want to stress it too much, but just think about what Proverbs is telling us. That the sacrifice of the wicked coming from wicked motives is an abomination. So just imagine if you are one of those people because of false teaching now giving to the church because you believe that it is a way to coerce God to give you something. Is that not a false motive? And definitely the teachers who teaches are most responsible even more than the congregants themselves. Giving big amounts of money because you believe that by doing that, God is now indebted to you to making you rich. I'm sorry, but that is indeed a wicked motive. And thus God is not pleased at all with such false generosity. We need to move forward now in verse 28. A false witness will not perish. Will perish, sorry. <laughs> a false witness will perish, but the word of a man who hears will endure. Liars are condemned, we know this. Ultimately, Satan is condemned. He is the father of lies. And those who follow him, false prophets and false teachers who speak lies, even worse, who claim to speak the truth of God's word but are really teaching you lies, they shall perish. God will judge them strictly. And so don't listen to them. Because the hearer, not of falsehood, but the hearer of the truth shall live. That's what it says. The word of a man who hears, speaking of the truth in contrast to falsehood, will endure, will live. Saints, consider then how we can be faithful witnesses if we are not faithful hearers. If the false witness will perish, but the word of a man who hears the truth shall endure. 
then even when it comes to us as Christian witnesses in this world who are to speak the truth in love and to preach the gospel to the lost, consider how we can only be faithful witnesses if and when we are also faithful hearers. So, fellow wise warrior, how is your listening? How has your expository listening been? We used to talk about that a lot. Before a warrior can go out and execute the battle plans, you know what he needs to do first? He needs to sit down with the rest of the army before their commander-in-chief and listen so that he can take orders. Now, this is the foolishness of some of these movements that send people out as so-called missionaries and evangelists and gospel preachers, people who are not rooted in a gospel-believing and preaching local church of our Lord Jesus Christ. For even the world knows that before a warrior can go out to battle, he needs to first go to the base camp, sit with the rest of the warriors, and listen to his commander-in-chief so that he can take those orders and he can do what the master said. He can do what the commander has said. The same goes for us Christian warriors. We need to listen before we speak. We need to listen before we go. We need to listen before we can wage war. Oh, and there's a big war not only in our hearts. There is, let's now recognize it, a huge war out there. We do need to get out there. Verse 29 says, A wicked man puts on a bold face, but the upright gives thought to his ways. A wicked man puts on a bold face. You know what that is? He's wicked, and he's performing wickedness, and he does not hesitate. He's just going to do it. He is resolved. He doesn't hesitate. A bold face of a wicked man, it means he is brave in his wickedness. Honestly, sometimes the bold face of the wicked man puts some of us to shame. We often fail to be brave in our righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. We are the ones that have Christ and His righteousness and His truth and His good news. But sometimes we go out there and the wicked have bolder faces and bolder approaches in their stupidity and falsehood than we do in our truth. The wicked man is brave in his wickedness, and this is what we are seeing in culture today. In culture today, and it's always been this way, but it's expressing itself in a certain way today, this is what we're having to fight against. Wickedness is now bold. Wickedness is no longer something that you need to hide. Wickedness is no longer something you need to keep to yourself. Wickedness is now something that you need to shout out. It's something you need to announce. It's something that you need to celebrate. We've got quite a few uni students here. Why don't I read from uh, Monash's website, Monash Uni. Um, go to monash.edu slash pride. Um, and this is what it says about pride. I quote, at Monash, we have a strong tradition of supporting our LGBTIQA plus community. And while we celebrate our strides forward, we also recognize there is still work to be done to ensure everyone feels safe seen and heard. It is important to us to go beyond words and give students the opportunity to experience what it means to be part of a genuinely inclusive community. It's with tremendous joy that we have chosen to incorporate the celebration of pride into our orientation program since 2023. In addition, this year, this was last year, this year we'll be sending our students to World Pride in Sydney and hosting a range of events that invite the Monash community to join in celebration with our LGBTIQA plus friends and colleagues together. We can create a community built on a culture of inclusion, a community that embraces our diversity, embraces our diversity, and a community in which our LGBTIQA plus friends and colleagues feel they belong. Close quote. A wicked man puts on a bold face. This is bold. And the boldness that you are finding in this falsehood is often bolder than the boldness you will find in the church when it comes to our truthfulness. The upright, though, 
Before we rush forward and go, all right, well, I'm going to put up a specific response on my website, and um, I'm going to take this down line by line. Maybe you can do that, but don't forget, the upright gives thought to his ways. You see, even though we want to talk about boldness, and we do need to be bold in these areas, let us just remember that wisdom wages war, not like the world. The upright, he actually gives thought to his ways. He actually thinks about what he's doing. He's not headstrong. He wants to walk in wisdom. He wants to test his ways according to the scriptures. If culture is loud in its wickedness, well, yes, maybe I do feel I need to be loud in my righteousness. But even then, first and foremost, what do the scriptures say? How should I wage this war? How do I move forward in this and thus we must tell those who hold these worldly philosophies and wicked ideologies and promote these sinful lifestyles over and against the wisdom of God, we call upon you all. And here's our last point. Stop warring against wisdom. We need to warn these people they will lose. We need to warn these people that even a wise poor man in a little city, if they don't recognize it, he will destroy the greatest of kings. Verse 30, no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. Guys, whatever wisdom, whatever understanding, whatever counsel there is out there, which sets itself up against God, it shall not succeed. What, what I just read from that page on the Monash website, that's not gonna last. You know, but it, it's lasted long. Yeah, it might, and it might last another 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I don't know, 100 years, I don't know how long the world has left. I mean, it's gonna last in that sense, right? In that sense, it's gonna last a little bit, but it will not last forever. It will not succeed. None of it can avail against the Lord. Oppose God, you will die. Oppose God, you will lose. Turn with me to, to Psalm chapter 33. Here's a warning for all who oppose wisdom. Psalm chapter 33 in verses 10 and 11. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of His heart to all generations. It's not going to last, brothers and sisters. Finally, the last verse of Proverbs 21, verse 31. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. <coughs> You look at what's going on in the bold-faced wickedness of the day. They've got their chariots. They've got their powers. They've got their government protection and promotion. They've got their funding. They've got their, what seems to be, strongholds upon the people of this land. Their horses are ready for the day of battle. But little do they know, the victory belongs to the Lord. In the ancient world, to have soldiers on horseback is the equivalent of military, today, military units today who have soldiers in tanks. This is well understood. If you've got in those days soldiers on horseback, it's as good as knowing, well, this nation's got soldiers in tanks. Do you really want to mess with them? I mean, cool, you've got heavy artillery and whatnot, but do you have tanks? Because they've got a bunch of tanks. All the greatest armies of the world, though, still are no match for the strong arm of God. God shows this in His wisdom, in what seems to reverse the world's thinking, such as in the crossing of the Red Sea. I mean, what was that? Pharaoh sends them, chase them, chariots, horsemen, weapons. They've got that heavy artillery. They've got like soldiers and tanks. And what does God do? All of the Israelites just go and just cross the Red Sea. And then the, 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 the chariots and the soldiers and all these people of Pharaoh, they try to chase after him to take them down. And what happens? They just get swallowed up by the Red Sea. And they're all dead. They're dead now. 
they were obliterated. Gideon, same thing happened there. Didn't seem like they could do it. Didn't seem like he would be the one, but God came out on top. Of course, who could forget David and Goliath and how he destroyed that giant. And finally, there is Christ, victorious through a cross. Psalm 33, verse 17, the war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. The way that the great armies would make these huge chariots, or even later on when they would develop these catapults, and you could set things on fire and catapult it over, over a wall and destroy entire cities. Oh, nothing compared to what Christ can do with two planks of wood on Calvary. Because ultimately the war we are fighting is a spiritual one. It is not even against left-wing universities at the end of the day. Or mere influential individuals who have lots of followers who are deceiving people. Finally, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 10 onwards. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. The cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all, at all times in the Spirit, with prayer and supplication, to that end, Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I might declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So we refute the foolishness of this world, not by acting foolish ourselves and just copying their tactics, but by putting on the belt of truth. We refute the foolishness of this world not by presenting our own selves as righteous, but by wearing the righteousness of Christ on our chests. And we go forth not to vanquish God's enemies by simply stomping on them, but by bringing them the gospel of peace. And when we are going forth, with the truth, and they are incited, and they curse at us, and mock us, and attack us, we take up the shield of faith, trusting, believing, vengeance belongs to the Lord, and that the Christ whom we trust is faithful to save those who have faith in Him, and faithful to judge those who remain in their sins. We wear His salvation on our heads as we continue to fight the good fight, equipped with the sword of His Word. The sword, which pierces the hearts of sinners and brings them to repentance or slays the unrepentant on the day of judgment. And at all times, we turn to our Commander-in-Chief through prayer. Prayer for ourselves and especially for gospel ministers, praying that even if they are placed in chains by the foolish powers of this world, they might declare the gospel boldly. In the end, wisdom wins the war. 
and worldly philosophies, earthly chariots, human rulers, Satan, or even our own sin, do not stand a chance against the infinite wisdom of our God. If you are still warring against wisdom, stop wasting your energy. Your efforts are futile. Our wise warrior Jesus scales the walls of the kingdom of darkness and breaks down its strongholds. Do not wait until the day He destroys all earthly kingdoms before you surrender. Turn from your idols. Turn from your ungodly ideologies and philosophies now. Turn from your pride and desire to be your own commander-in-chief and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ who conquers death and gives us life. Wisdom wins the war. Let's pray. Oh, Father, you have imparted so much wisdom to us from your word. There is not much for us to, to say, but to thank you and to praise you. We thank you, Lord God, that indeed the fear of the Lord, the fear of you, Yahweh, is the beginning of true knowledge, true wisdom, and that indeed you have granted to us. Lord, we prayed at the beginning before this sermon that what we do not know you would teach us. Thank you, O oh God, for teaching us. And that the things that we lack, you would give us. Thank you for equipping us, O oh God. And lastly, we prayed, Lord, that what we are not, you would make us. O oh God, sanctify us by what we have heard. May this church increase in wisdom and knowledge and stature before you, just as our Lord Jesus himself did as a young man. May we grow into maturity as a body, fighting the foolishness of this world and the remaining foolishness of our flesh with divine wisdom from above. And Lord, may we have confidence that you are our great and mighty warrior, that at the end of the day, this is not our battle to win by our own strength. You are the conqueror. You are the winner. You are the Christus victor. Christ, the victor, savior of our souls, O oh God. And we thank you that before anything else, firstly, you have conquered our own hearts. Thank you for making us subject to you. For we would now have it no other way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.